Happy Veterans Day to all of our veterans. We salute you today. I certainly hope you feel honored and loved because we, uh, we do both of those on this very special day. We are so grateful to all of our veterans. We thank God for the uh, liberty and the freedoms that we have because of uh, your dedication, your sacrifice, and your service. And so we certainly honor you today and uh, thank God that uh, you have given your all for our country and we praise uh, God for it tonight. Well, we welcome you. Uh, it's Wednesday night. It's Bible study time. If you have your Bibles, you can be opening them up to the book of Matthew, the ninth chapter. That's where we're going to be studying tonight in just a few moments. Before we do that, let's receive our offering tonight. And in just a moment, there'll be some instructions on the screen for how you can give tonight in our service. Uh, and then after that, we're going to get right into the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we Gather tonight, Lord, and uh, give you praise and thanks again for this special day when we honor our veterans, Lord. We just pray a special blessing upon them tonight, and God, just ask you to be with our young men and women that are serving actively today, God, all over this great world, Lord. There's many, God, that are serving uh, in uh, various capacities, and we just pray, God, you'd bless them, bless their families, keep them safe, bring them home uh, soon, Lord, and God, we just uh, thank you for it. God, we thank you tonight for the gifts of your people that we're receiving in this offering. God, I just ask you to speak to our hearts and help us always uh, in uh, opportunities like this to be obedient to whatever we should give. And so, God, we again thank you that every need's met. We bless and praise your wonderful name uh, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, turn with us tonight to Matthew, the ninth chapter. We're winding our way down. We'll be finished in another week or two and it, with chapter number nine, but got a great story tonight. I want to read it to you, and then we're going to get into uh, our study. So if you have your Bibles open to Matthew 9, let's start reading in verse number 27. It says, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Now note what they said. They said, Yes, Lord. 29, Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But they, well, when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all of that country. Look at verse 32. And as they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. Uh, if you've been with us throughout our study in the book of Matthew, uh, I told you at the very beginning that Matthew's purpose in writing his gospel was to display Christ as king, to show us that Jesus uh, was the Messiah, that Christ, the promised king, the one that would come ultimately to reverse the curse and establish a kingdom in which there would be no sin. He would destroy the works of the enemy and he would do great and mighty things. And in order to convince us of that, he does it in many ways. You know, in chapter 1, uh, he revealed Christ as king through his birth, through his royal lineage. Uh, but in chapters 8 and 9, uh, Matthew begins to reveal uh, who he is through his miracle-working power. Uh, he selects nine miracles 
Uh, and in so doing, he helps us to see the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy because the Old Testament in so many, many places told us what the Messiah would be like and the things that he would do. The Old Testament is rich in prophecy concerning the millennial kingdom of Christ. And uh, in Christ, uh, the king, we call him king of kings and lord of lords, but he will one day on earth be a literal king of kings and lord of lords. He will establish a kingdom that will last for a thousand years, and what a kingdom it will be. You know, the Old Testament prophesies that the kingdom, in the kingdom, that Jesus will take the desert places and he will make them like gardens. He will take the dead sea and he will bring it to life and, and fill it full of fish. He says there will be a river that flows and along that river will be uh, all manner of trees and in the leaves of the trees there will be healing for the nations. And in that kingdom there will be no sickness. In that kingdom he'll return man to the original creation glory. You know, people used to live a thousand years. Well, they'll do it again in the millennial kingdom of Jesus. And so Jesus uh, uh, came and uh, uh, he just gave us a preview of all that he will do. He was king then. Uh, he will be king forevermore. But uh, in his first coming, he was just giving us a preview of coming attractions. He was just showing us those things that would come to pass in his millennial kingdom. If you were with us last week, the last miracle we looked at in chapter 9, uh, he revealed his power over death. He raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, and, and what, a, what a, a glorious story that is. But that's, again, what the prophecies of the Old Testament predicted. Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 65, Daniel chapter 12, uh, spoke of the Messiah's power even over death. And if Jesus is the Messiah, then he must be able to demonstrate that power. And that is precisely what he did in raising Jairus' daughter. And that's what Matthew wants us to see. But not only did he have power over dead people, tonight I want you to see that he had power over the dead factors of people who were living. He had, uh, he had power over dead eyes. We're going to see that tonight. That's the title of my message is Dead Eyes. He, he had power over dead eyes or dead ears or dead tongues. That's what's demonstrated in this passage tonight. And again, it's nothing more than fulfillment of what the prophets of old said would happen. Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6 says this, Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart or a deer, and the tongue of the dumb will sing. Miracles of sight and sound. That, that's precisely what we're going to see tonight uh, in verses 27 to 33 of Matthew 9. And it's another demonstration of the fact that Jesus was uh, who he proclaimed himself to be, the coming Messiah. So let's look at our, our text tonight, starting in verse number 27. It says, And when Jesus had departed from there, where has he departed from? Well, he's departed from the house of Jairus. He's just raised, in our previous verse, he just has raised her, uh, Jairus' daughter, from the dead. By now it's evening. It's been a busy day. Jesus has been working uh, the ministry all day long. He began in that morning speaking with the disciples of John and disputing with the Pharisees. And then Jairus came and uh, compelled him to come to his home because his daughter who was sick was dying and she literally did die before he got there. And, and so Jesus began the journey from, uh, uh, to Jairus' house. But along the way, the woman with the issue of blood had came and touched the hem of his garment. And uh, Jesus had stopped and administered unto her. And now by the time he leaves Jairus' house, it's probably evening. The sun is beginning to set. And remember, there's a mass of humanity around him. They've been following him all day long. They followed him as he went to Jairus' house. There were multitudes that, that were uh, uh, surrounding him. Even more probably when he healed the woman with the issue of blood. 
And now he is leaving. It is, it is evening, and now he's got another crowd that is joined with the crowd that's already been following him. For now, uh, he went into Jairus' house, and if you remember the story, the, the funeral service was already in process. And uh, Jairus, being a ruler of the synagogue, uh, probably much of the town was there uh, to mourn with him the death of his daughter. And so all of these people gathered with him, and, and there's this great throng that are leaving uh, from Jairus' house. And Jesus is moving. He's moving probably. It's evening. He's moving towards the house where he was staying uh, at in the city of Capernaum. And so the story unfolds. And, and I want to work through this story with just a very simple outline. And, and I want you to see this wonderful miracle that Jesus does uh, with these two blind men. The first thing I want you to note is the condition of the men. I, I want you to to see what it says about him. In verse 27, it says, Two blind men followed him. You know, blindness was a, a common malady in Israel in uh, Jesus' day. There would have been many blind people. Uh, they were blind for uh, numerous reasons. They were blind uh, because they didn't have uh, much of the medicine and the, uh, the opportunity that we would have in, in sicknesses and things that would cause us blindness. They, they didn't have uh, opportunity of those things, poverty and unsanitary conditions. Uh, the brilliance of the sunlight, and, and Israel is a very, uh, a very hot and a very dry climate, and, and the sun uh, shines most days. It, it's brilliant, and it causes problems. You know, when we go down uh, many times into Central and South America to Peru and Guatemala, uh, one of the things that we've taken in the past have been sunglasses because so many people suffer eye problems because just of the intensity of the sun. They're down closer to the equator, and, and many people have uh, eye problems. Problems. There was, of course, the blowing sand. There would have been accidents. Uh, accidents. There, there were a lot of reasons. A lot of people were uh, born blind. Remember the, uh, the one that Jesus healed that was born blind. And uh, the disciples asked him, oh, is this man blind because of his parents? It said he was, born, he was blind from his mother's womb. And, and so uh, uh, it was very common for children, even for babies, to be blind, you know. Today, when children are born, if, if you've ever, a da as a dad, I remember when my children were born, one of the very first things when a child is born after they clean them up a little bit is they open their eyes and they put antiseptic in their eyes because there are certain things that can be passed from the mother during the birthing process that can cause blindness. But uh, that's been eliminated in our day, but it wasn't in Jesus' day. So, so I don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know how or when these men had been blind, but the, they were both blind. And, and they hung around together, which again would not have been uncommon. They, they needed one another. They, they helped one another. You know, Jesus one time told the Pharisees, you're like the blind leading the blind. And <clears throat> when the blind leads the blind, they both fall into the ditch. And so it would have not been uncommon for blind people to, to come together. And so, so these men, their condition is they're blind. But secondly, I want you to note the cry of the men, and this is, this is a very important point. The two men followed him, and, and they're in the crowd. They're, there's a multitude of people, and, and they're, they're being moved by their senses. They're following uh, this mass as they move along, yet they cannot see. And yet, here they are, and, and they're in their blindness. They're pushing, and they're pressing along with everybody else, and they're crying out, and it says, and they're, they're also saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. I like these guys. They're bold. They're not shy. They, 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 they weren't worried about uh, offending anyone. They weren't worried about getting loud. They, they come shoving their way along and crying out because... They had heard of Jesus. They had, they had not been able to see the miracles that he had done, but they had heard of the miracles. They were probably at Jairus' house and heard the uproar when he raised this young girl from the dead. And so they understood that Jesus was a miracle worker. And, and so they followed him. And, and I, I, I would just note here, uh, what I love about the stories of Jesus and about the people that he ministered to, uh, the people that followed Jesus were typically the brokenhearted. They were typically the hurting. They were typically the outcast. 
They were typically the discouraged and the lonely and the sinful. Those were the men and women that most often followed after Jesus. It wasn't those who were self-sufficient. It wasn't those who had what they needed because, uh, because they didn't need Jesus. But I'm telling you, when you were hurting and, 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 and in need, that's the kind of people that so often come to the Lord. And can I just add something right there? I, I, I think I need to say this, uh, that we should be mindful of people that are hurting uh, and, and not in the way that you might think. You know, we are so, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, and, and to have the heart of God, we should be compassionate and we, could be, we should be kind to people that are hurting and in need. Can I tell you, uh, uh, what brings people to Jesus, Jesus most often is desperation. What brings people to Jesus most often uh, is they come at the depths of their needs. And we just need to be sensitive to that aspect because sometimes I think in helping people, we really hurt them because we're, we're working against God who has been bringing them to a place that they desperately need Him. And, and you know, sometimes jail has been the salvation of somebody. Sometimes sickness has been the salvation of somebody. Sometimes the death of a loved one has been salvation to people. I've preached in funerals when, when people are brokenhearted and weeping over the loss of a loved one and, and presented to them Christ and watch people in a funeral service give their hearts and lives to Jesus. I'm not saying that we should be, we just should be sensitive to the Holy Spirit into what God is doing. Sometimes we got to throw our Jonas off the boat because God wanted Jonah in the ocean and the sailors in their compassion tried to save him. But, but listen, some people we can't save. We need to put them in the hands of a loving God who is bringing them to the place that they might search him and find him. And so this man and his friend, they, they're crying. And the word basically means they were yelling. They were screaming. They, they weren't just, they weren't just, their voices weren't just high. They were, they were, uh, they were trying to scream above everyone else. They were crying in agony because there's a desperation in their heart. And know what they cry out. They, they call him what? The son of David. The son of David. Why, why, why would they call him the son of David? He was commonly known of as Jesus of Nazareth. But they went past that and they called him the son of David. Did they know? Did they know his genealogy? Did they know that his father was Joseph and that Joseph literally came from the lineage of David or that even that his mother was of the lineage of David? I, I don't know that they knew that. But what I believe, I, I do know that they understood was that this term son of David was, uh, was the Israel's way of saying Messiah. It was their term for the coming uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I believe <clears throat> when they shouted out, Son of David, they understood. They, they, were, they were being very, uh, 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 very forward in their uh, appraisal of who he was. They were saying, we believe that you are the son of David, that you are the coming Messiah. And so they cried out, son of David, have mercy on us. To go with that knowledge of Jesus, they also had a right attitude. They believed not only that Jesus was the Messiah, that he had the power of the kingdom to bless them and to heal them, but they also knew that they didn't deserve it. They also knew that, that what they were asking from him, they didn't deserve for him to give unto them. That's why they cried out for mercy. You know that's what mercy is. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you do deserve. And these two men understood that, that they were not worthy of, uh, of the Messiah's blessing, that they were not worthy of his healing. But they believed and they cried out and, and they, they sought mercy. And praise God, they sought mercy from the right person. Because the most merciful person that has ever lived was the Lord Jesus Christ. He went around everywhere doing good. He had mercy on, on so many and, and he still does today. One of my favorite verses of Scripture is in Lamentations. And 
It says this, it is the Lord's mercy, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Hallelujah. You ought to just lift up your hand wherever you are right now and say, thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and your grace. Every one of us, everybody that's listening to me tonight, the one you're looking at tonight, I want you to know we all have received what we did not deserve. God gave us mercy. He's given us grace when we deserved hell and judgment. Praise his holy name. So they came to him and, and they understood who he was and they understood that if they received from him, it would be according to his mercy. And so they follow along and they're, they're screaming the, the scripture, uh, the, the word tells us. They're, 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 they're fanatical in their approach to him, but what you see in the story is that Jesus seems to pay no attention to them. They just continue the march from Jairus' house to, to where he's headed. Uh, he, he goes. He doesn't stop the crowd. He doesn't look at them. He doesn't call them to him. He just continues walking. He lets them keep pouring out. He lets them keep shouting. He lets them keep crying. And you say, that's awful harsh of Jesus. No, what he's doing is he, he's pulling out of them. They're, he is surrounded by fickle people. He is surrounded by many who will one day say crucify him. There are some who, who have somewhat of, a, uh, of an interest. They're, they're curious of this miracle worker, but he knows that in their hearts they, they don't truly believe in him and trust in him. But he wants to see where these men are. He's giving them a test of their faith. He wants to know if they will persist. And so, so he, he tests their faith. That brings me to the third point. I want to talk to you then about the confrontation in verse 28. Finally, he responds to them, but look how it happens. He said in verse 28, And when he was come into the house, what, what house are we talking about? Well, we really don't know what house. The scriptures don't tell us, but more than likely the house that Jesus was staying in. They're in the city of Capernaum. It had become his home base uh, for ministry, uh, and more than likely it was Peter's house. Many believe that Jesus uh, lived with Peter because uh, we know that Peter had a home. He had a wife. He had a mother-in-law in that city. And it says, watch this now. He, 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 the, the men follow him. I want you to catch this. They're, they're crying out. The crowd's following him. They're, they're, they're following him home. And, and Jesus doesn't respond to these blind men. And they keep crying and they keep crying. And Jesus gets home and maybe waves goodnight. And he goes into his home. And watch what happens. And the two blind men came to him. They didn't stop. He went home and they didn't stop. They just, I don't know if they knocked on the door. I don't know if they just entered in or got someone to lead them to the door, but, but they just came in. I, I'm, I'm struck by the, the, the lack of privacy that our Lord had, that, that, that everywhere he went, unless he got behind a rock somewhere on a mountain, it seemed like the crowds were always there pressuring. They were always there for a touch. They were always there uh, to hear his words. And, and he, he had such a lack of privacy. He went in the house and, and they went in right after him. And, and let, can I just say this? And I, I wouldn't say this. I would, I would never say this to give myself a pat on the back. I say this just simply because it's the truth. It's the truth of myself. It's the truth for every real pastor that I know. Could I tell you, our doors are always open for people. You can call us. Most pastors, I, I don't have my number here at uh, 678-923-2979. You can call me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because, uh, because uh, needy people need people. And pastors are called and, 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 and other Christians are called. We're there for you to be there. And, and it's because of the heart of Jesus. Jesus never turned people away. They came at all hours and at all times. And, and, uh, and he was always available to them. But they come into the house and, 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 uh, and here's another important truth that, that every one of the Every one of the miracles that we've seen in these two chapters, every one of them uh, occurred because of the persistence of somebody. Somebody just didn't want to be healed and, and it just wasn't the, uh, the opportunity didn't arise. Every one of these were, these people were persistent. They pushed themselves in. They pressed through crowds. 
Christ. You remember the man, the paralytic and, uh, that we studied about and, and, and his four friends brought him to Jesus, but there was no way to get to him because the house was full. What did they do? They crawled up on top of the house. They tore the roof apart and lowered the man down at the feet of Jesus. And because of their persistence, the man was made whole. I love this ruler, Jairus. He, he laid down his pride. He ra- laid aside his social status and he came in the midst. When Jesus was talking to the disciples of John, he just pushed himself in and made his request known. I, I, I can just imagine how he maybe uh, uh, prodded Jesus along when on the way Jesus stopped to heal this woman with the issue of blood. And time was of the essence to him, but, but he, he was persistent. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. Even when they came to him and said, don't bother the master, your daughter is dead, he persevered and he persisted and God worked a great miracle. You remember the woman with the issue of blood. She pressed herself through the crowd and she touched and clung to the hem of his garment. In every case, uh, the persistence paid off. These blind men follow him all the way home and when he goes home, goes in the house and closes the door, they still won't take no for an answer. They come to him. And Jesus said to them, watch this, believe ye that I am able to do this. He asked them a question. Now what a question that was. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Well, well, well they've, already, they've already proclaimed you the Messiah. They've already called you the son of David. So, uh, so obviously in their heart they have faith in who you are. They, they obviously believe that you're a miracle worker. They, they've watched uh, Jairus' daughter be raised from the dead. They've watched this woman with the issue of blood be made whole. Surely they believe in that. What is Jesus saying? Believe ye that I am able to do this. I believe Jesus understood that they understood. I believe Jesus knew that they had faith before he even asked the question. What is he doing? I'll tell you what I believe he's doing. I believe he simply wants to get them to open up their mouth and to say it. It's called the confession of faith. And the Bible says, If you shall confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And I believe he was just simply drawing out a verbal uh, a confirmation, a affirmation of their faith. Do you believe I'm able to do this and know what they said? They said, yes, what? Lord. Yes, Lord. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Jesus as what? The Bible says, as Lord. That was their affirmation of their faith. Now, as I said before, faith was not always necessary for healing. There were people in the New Testament, there were, there were many people that, that Jesus healed that it says nothing of their faith. There'll be someone we're going to read about in just a moment that, that, that there's no apparent faith there. The, the gospel is loaded with times when Jesus didn't heal people with faith. But can I tell you, Jesus never healed anybody spiritually. In other words, Jesus never saved anybody without faith. There must always be a profession. There must always be an exercise of real faith for conversion. And when a man says, I need mercy, and and when a man says, uh, you are Lord, you are are the son of David, and and when a man believes in the power of God to to work miracles, can I tell you, when he said, yes, Lord, there there was a consummation, I believe, of his faith. And so we move to his conversion, uh, 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 the fourth point, the conversion of these men. They were blind and they're crying out, Son of David, have mercy. He asked them, do you believe? And they say, yes, Lord. And here's the conversion, verse 29. Then touched he their eyes, saying, watch this, according to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. Now I know from this text, I know that when Jesus touched them and said those words, that their physical eyes that had been blind, maybe, maybe they had never seen anything their entire life, maybe from children, they had both uh, been blind. But can I tell you, their eyes immediately opened and they saw. But can I tell you something? I believe with all of my heart, not only did their physical eyes open, but their spiritual eyes were opened at the same time. I believe this is a beautiful, a beautiful, a beautiful uh, analogy of what it means to truly be saved. And these men, 
They, they had true faith, and their confession of faith, I believe, worked not only the miracle of divine healing, but it worked the miracle of salvation in their hearts. So we've seen the condition, the cry, the confrontation, uh, the, con- conversa- the conversion. Look at number 5, uh, and, and it said in verse 30, And Jesus strictly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. I want you to look at the command. Jesus gave them a command. Now, now, now think about this. These men are blind and now Jesus says uh, very sternly, he, ch- he strictly charged them. That's a, that's a very powerful verb that he uses there. He, he's very serious with this. He says, he says, don't let anyone know. See that no man know. Well, how are we going to do that, Lord? How are we going to do that? Are we, are we going to close our eyes and walk around and bump into things and act like we're blind? How are we going to, how are we going to, people not going to know? How's our family not going to know? How's our friends? We live in a small town. How's not everybody in the city going to know that, that, that what you have done? And yet Jesus says, don't let anyone know. Well, some people believe he, he meant that he wanted to hide the fact that he was a miracle worker. Well, that's nonsense because that's all he's doing. He's going around working miracles. Uh, the whole land knows that he's a miracle worker. Others say, well, he didn't want anyone to find out about this, this particular miracle. But that, again, that, that can't be so simply because uh, uh, these men were known to be blind and everybody that knew them was going to know that uh, something miraculous had happened to them. What did he mean? Well, I think he meant several things. Uh, You know, the men, what was the title that they they proclaimed him to be? They they called him Son of David. That was, again, that was uh, an Israeli form of saying Messiah. They literally called him the Messiah. And what I believe Jesus was telling them is, I don't want you going around proclaiming that I am the Messiah. Don't go around telling people who I am. Uh, uh, Why? Because it's not time. Uh, you, you, you need to understand something about God. God's got a divine timetable. And for Jesus, it wasn't time yet to push, to push that message. He himself was not pushing it at this point. Uh, because it would, number one, would not be received. Uh, he didn't come through the religious authority of the day. So the religious Jews would not accept him uh, as such. Uh, uh, the Romans, if it word got around that he was proclaiming himself to be Messiah, to be king, they had one king and his name was Caesar and he knew that that would cause him problems. And if you've read the whole story, you knew what ultimately, what ultimately got Jesus crucified was this thought that he was a king. And, and they presented him as such uh, to, to the Romans, and, and he was crucified. He didn't want them but simply because it wasn't time yet. I think another reason he didn't want it is because these two men were not capable at this point. They had, they had received their sight, but they were not capable of properly acknowledging, of properly uh, spreading that message. They were babes in Christ, and, and it wasn't time. It, it, they, needed, they needed to know more. They, 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 he didn't want some half-cocked, confused message about who he was being spread in the land. And so he didn't want them sharing that. And finally, I think he wanted people to conclude for themselves. He, he didn't want people going on hearsay. He wanted people like these two men to come and make up their mind about who he was and to make their own choice and their decision to receive him as who he was. But you know what they did? He said, don't, don't go tell anybody. Look what they did, verse 31. And when they departed, they spread abroad, abroad his fame in all the country. What did they do? They did exactly what he told them not to do. Exactly. And, and, and I don't know. That, that I think could be somewhat understandable. I, I don't know that I'd have a hard time keeping things quiet if, if, if Jesus had done something so wonderful uh, in my life and they're, they're, they're babes in Christ and, and they don't fully and they're excited and there's a certain zeal about what has happened and and so they, it's just almost like they couldn't contain themselves. I'm not telling you it wasn't wrong. It was wrong because Jesus said don't do it, and they did it. But, but out of their zeal, out of, out of a, it, it, it may be the, one of the few sins that's the sin of a grateful heart, but out of the abundance of, their, uh, of, of what God had done in him, they, they went ahead and spread uh, uh, abroad his fame in all of that country. 
That speaks to the to, to these men were contrary. They were contrary to the command of the Lord. But it doesn't end there. And, and, and we could, this kind of ends their story, and I could end for tonight at this point, but but it's really not the end. And and I, I'm gonna come back. We're gonna I want to look at uh, the next verse, and I'm going to come back and maybe begin there next time. But, but I want you to see this, the end of this story. You have the condition they were blind. They, uh, the cry, the son of David, have mercy. You have the confrontation. Jesus said, do you believe? You have the conversion according to your faith. You have the command, don't say it. You have the contrariness. Uh, they said it everywhere. But finally, I want you to look at the commitment of these men. You can doubt whether they were uh, children of God if you want to because they disobeyed immediately when, when the Lord told them not to. But, but th- this next verse shows us something uh, so wonderful, and I want you to see it. Verse 32, it says, As they went out, as they went out of the house, they can now see as they, as they left the presence of the Lord, began to spread abroad all that he had done. Watch this, behold or look. This is, this is amazing. Remember I told you whenever you see the word behold, it's, it's a, it, it, it should perk your interest. This is something amazing. How amazing this is. Behold, they brought to him a dumb man. And the word there, uh, the Greek word there probably means he was not only uh, dumb, but he was also deaf. He was deaf. He couldn't hear or speak. And he was obviously one of their friends because, because these type people would have, would have hung around each other. They needed each other. You got two blind men, two blind men, and you got another man that can see, but he can't hear and he can't speak. And, and you know, when you get them together, they kind of make a hole. They can kind of help each other uh, through some things. And, and so they immediately went out and they find their friend. I love this. They went out and uh, the first thing they did, they left the house and, and they went out and they found their friend and they brought him to Jesus. And I, I want you to see the commitment of these men. One of their, one of their fellow uh, beggars is deaf and dumb and they want him to receive what they've received. You know, deafness, again, was not uncommon. It would have been very common uh, in Jesus' day. But this man wasn't deaf because of some physical infirmity. He wasn't deaf and dumb because of some accident that he had had or some sickness that he had had. He was demon-possessed. And we know through Scripture that demon possession can affect people in a physical way. And this man was deaf and dumb because demons had embodied him and, and so affected him. But how many of you know Jesus has the power over demons too? We've already saw that. He not only had power to heal the sick, he had power to cast out devils. And so in verse 33 it says, And when the demon was cast out, the dumb man spoke. Doesn't say anything about how Jesus did it. Doesn't say anything about this man having any faith to believe the Lord. It just simply says that when they brought him to him, Jesus cast the demon out. And when he did, this man began to speak. Now listen, and, and I'm going to close. I, 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 I think the reason for adding this little tale about this man is that Jesus wanted to affirm, uh, I, I don't believe that, that the man was healed because he expressed a particular faith in the Lord because I believe the Scripture would have, would have revealed that. I believe Jesus healed the man just for the sake of the two uh, blind men that they would become useful in His kingdom, that, that their commitment would bring glory to God and bring people, others, to Christ. That's, that's the, the simple story here. And, and it's one of the most beautiful analogies of salvation, I think, in all of the Gospels. Their blindness, their physical blindness, becomes an analogy of our spiritual blindness, of our being lost and blinded by sin. And if you walk through that story, let me just walk through it real quickly. Just, just each point real quickly now and, and look at it from that standpoint. They were blind and they knew that. Listen, you can't, I, I tell people all the time, you can't be found, you can't be saved until you know you're lost. These men were blind and they knew it. They recognized their need. 
Their need then uh, led them to knowledge because their desperation began to open up their heart to a word that there was a, someone who was able to heal their blindness. And can I tell you, when you, uh, when you come to the place that you understand that you're lost and that you're spiritually blind, you began to seek after knowledge and, and the knowledge opened to them that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of David. They sought to know the truth and they found truth and believed it. That was followed by a sense of sinfulness. They, they said, have mercy. They came under conviction. They, once they understood who they were and who Jesus was, they understood they weren't worthy of anything that he had. And so they, they were broken and they fell upon their face seeking the grace and mercy of God. And listen, you'll never get saved trying to bring your good works under the kingdom of God. You'll never get there by thinking you're better than anybody else when you find out that you're lost and that he God, I tell you, it will lead you to a sense of brokenness. And they cried out and said, Lord, have mercy. Then they expressed their faith. Jesus said, if you seek me with all your what heart, you will find me. And so they persistently, their faith, their faith kept them seeking after the Lord. They, they searched for him and they followed him and they wouldn't take no for an answer. Listen, you'll never get saved until you're willing to step out of a chair one day on a Sunday morning and walk down an aisle or, or you're ready. Listen, you gotta, you got to be able to profess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Your, your faith has got to become so real that you're not ashamed of it because if you're ashamed of him before me and he'll be ashamed of you before your father, but their, their persistence was, was motivated by their faith and trust that he was who he said he was. And then comes their, their pro confession. He said, do you believe? And they said, yes, Lord. Jesus Christ was Lord. And then their conversion, according to your faith, he said, be it unto you. And you know what followed their conversion? You know what followed their salvation? Weakness. They, they fail the Lord. And, and, and if you've uh, uh, been saved uh, for more than a few minutes, you understand that after you got saved, you failed too. Why? Because you were just a babe in Christ. And the depths and the understanding of the things of God were yet to be understood. And you, you had to grow and mature. And every one of us, we've had our share of mistakes. We've had our, our share of weaknesses even after we were saved. And these men... Uh, in, even in their zeal, they were disobedient to what God told them to do. But finally, what I love about the story is it ends with their, with their use, usefulness because intermingled with their disobedience was their desire to bring somebody else to Jesus Christ. They, they wanted someone else to experience what they had experienced. And can I tell you, if you've ever been saved, that's got to be the motivating factor of your heart. You've got to want other people to enjoy and to have what you have experienced in the Lord. I've told this story before, but uh, I, I heard a preacher one time. He said he was going to church one Sunday morning, and he was uh, uh, running a little late, but he just had to get, stop and get some gas. It was almost time for church to start, and he stopped at a gas station. He, he was filling his car up, and he heard a voice on the other side of the pump saying, you need to go to church with me today. He, he looked around and, and he saw a, a just kind of a rough-looking guy. I mean, he, he, was, uh, he, was, he didn't look like a Christian, but he looked around and the guy said, you need to go to church with me today. And the preacher looked and said, well, I thank you so much for that invitation. I appreciate you being so energetic and zealous of the Lord, but, but I'm a pastor of a church and I'm on my way to church. He looked at the guy, and the guy said, I don't care. You need to go to church with me today. Kind of took the preacher back, and he said, what, what do you mean I need to go to church with you today? And the guy looked at him, and he said, you need to go to church with me today because Jesus is going to be at church with me today. He was, he was excited. I don't know what had happened in his life, but God had so touched him and so transformed him that he wanted to make sure that everybody got to where he knew Jesus was going to be. Praise God. Can I tell you tonight... Uh, from one blind man that was once blind, but now I see, could I just step out and maybe ask somebody that's watching tonight, uh, would you like to come and see the one that has transformed and changed my life? Would you like to meet the one that has come into my heart and made all things new? I'd love to invite you to come and, and see him and, and know him because he is truly the Messiah. He is the King.
He's the Lord of lords, the King of kings, and He's coming one day soon to establish a kingdom that will rule and last forever and forever. And you don't want to miss that kingdom. Jesus, listen, if you read the story in the Bible, Jesus just gave us a preview of coming attractions, of all the healings and of all the miracles. They are just a foretaste of all that God has in store for those who know Him and love Him. And if you don't, tonight you can. By simple faith in Him, just like these blind men, by simple faith and trust in Him, you too can invite Him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, and He'll come in and do that. Can I pray with you tonight? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, there may be someone that is watching uh, this live stream tonight, and God, Lord, this Word has uh, reached through a camera, God, and grabbed hold of their heart. And like these two blind men, God, they've come to an understanding of their great need. And they would cry out, Lord, from the depths of their heart, Have mercy on me, Son of David, King of kings, Lord of lords, Messiah, soon coming King, Christ the Lord, come into my heart and be my Savior. And he had asked you tonight, Do you believe that he is who he said he is? Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? Did he shed his blood for you? That he was buried and three days later he rose again victorious over death, hell, and the grave. If you can believe that and say like these blind men said, Yes, Lord, he'll come into your heart and into your life and be your Savior. Father, I thank you tonight for the opportunity to share your word. God, would you bless it now. Multiply it in the hearts of your people. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Lighthouse. Love you. Look forward to seeing you. Sunday, listen, if you haven't gotten back out to church, uh, please, I invite you to come. I know if you're not ready, stay home, but, but if you're ready, you need to come and be a part of the family of Christ. We're doing great. God's doing great things in our body, and we long so long to see you back in service with us. So God bless you. We'll see you Sunday.